Good morning, everyone. I'm starting to see everyone come into the room. Welcome to our show, Small Biz Talk, uh, Solutions for Your Small Business with Lori Williams. Good morning, Lori. Good morning, Lauren. Excited to be here again. It's just becoming part of my every week. Get on, do a show. I am just loving the show. And I just want to again say thanks to all those frequent flyers that are with us every week. And thanks to you, Lauren, handling everything going on in the chat. Like I said, guys, I read it afterwards and I'm like, man, the party is in the chat. <laughs> That chat room definitely keeps me busy, but I love to see the conversations and seeing everyone engage and just, you know, share stories and insight and really comment about all the useful information they're receiving from you. So it's, it's great. <laughs> well, and that's always wonderful to hear. And guess what, Lauren, I'm going to be announcing a whole bunch of shows coming up. We're starting to get more guests. I'm, I'm starting to catch up with this idea. As you guys know, I kind of created the idea and then I got Lauren involved with me who gladly jumped on the show with me and and now I'm kind of catching up but we got a really exciting series coming up and I'm going to tell everybody about that in just a bit. Awesome awesome well then let me go ahead and start sharing my screen okay and give a quick overview for those who are new to the show as to who we are and kind of what we're doing here. And so again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lauren Simpson and I'm with the Small Business Development Center or the SBDC. The SBDC uh, is a national program that has over a thousand locations throughout the country. So I say this every week, but no matter where you are in the country, in the US, you should be able to get connected with a local SBDC center. And you will wanna do so because we offer no cost services to local small businesses. And they're at no cost because your tax dollars are already taken care of it. So you might as well um, benefit. And so for the Los Angeles network, which is the network that I represent, uh, we have um, centers all throughout the Los Angeles, uh, Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. And you can see them here represented on the map. We go, go as far out as Camarillo and Santa Clarita over to uh, Pasadena and then down to Long Beach. And then again, we offer no cost business advising. And so you can be connected to a uh, business advisor or an expert like Lori. Um, she's like the guru of numbers, <laughs> all things numbers. If numbers are playing a factor into your business, which I know they are, you'll definitely wanna get in contact with Lori and someone else of her expertise, um, as well as marketing, uh, social media, you name it, we have experts in that field. And then we also offer virtual trainings much like what you're experiencing or will experience today. And then you can contact us uh, to become a client at area code 866, that's 588-7232. Or you can reach us online, smallbizla.org forward slash new client. If you're outside the Los Angeles network, you can uh, get connected with a local SBDC center at americasbdc.org forward slash find your SBDC. And with that, Lori, I am going to go ahead and stop my screen share and, okay. oh, I should do some quick housekeeping. Uh, for those of you who are new to the show, any questions, please be sure to put those into our Q&A. Again, questions in the Q&A because Lori is monitoring the Q&A along with me. Uh, for the chat, please be sure to, um, don't put your questions there. <laughs> we want to be sure that Lori is able to um, at least see your questions and hopefully address them. So again, questions in the Q&A, the chat, I will be putting in various links, uh, especially links to our guest today. And now Lori, I'm going to hand it over to you. Wonderful. Well, I just want to start out by quick telling everybody kind of what's coming up for the next sessions. So next week, we're going to have an interview and we're going to learn the good, bad, and ugly of owning an Airbnb business. I know many people have thought about doing that, doing that with some homes, some recreational homes they have. I am going to be joined with a couple that's been in the business for some time, especially during COVID. They're going to share a lot of information about that. Then in, after that, we're going to talk with someone who can tell us a lot about designing and sourcing clothes 
clothing apparel. He has been involved in the industry forever. He designs the apparel and has actually sourced it from all over the world. And he'll tell you some of the dilemmas he's had during COVID as well as he started the business and how he's twisting his business a little bit. Then after that, we're going to get a learn from Lori in there. I have another guest interview, but what I want to tell you about is starting the end of March, April, I'm going to have a special three-week focus. Experts are going to share their advice on how to increase sales with social media, website, and marketing strategies. So my focus was that, you know, the upcoming weeks, we're talking from different entrepreneurs. And, you know, each time we're talking about what did you do to increase sales? What did you do to, you know, distribute products? So we're getting an idea of what they did. And then we're going to have some experts come on. And for those of you who have joined us in the past and know our own dear Deborah Darris, she is going to come back. She will be the end of March, tell us more social media, and then we have two new guests. So we're going to really learn how you can use these great tools to increase your sales. So from there, I'm going to bring Lauren back in and put you back on the spot, Lauren. You thought you were done. Nope, I'm going to put you on the spot here. So why I am is our guest, before I introduce our guest, I want to tell you that she comes from a very special program that exists at the SBDC. In fact, how I learned about the guest is that I have been asked and been a presenter to the program for, I think, about two or three cohorts now, if I'm not mistaken. But here's the great news. Our very own Lauren came through the program, and that's how she got involved with the SBDC. So, Lauren, I couldn't not take you and put you on the hook. We, you got to tell about the program because this involves you too. So, tell us about the BBS group. So, I will first off, I am such a um, proponent for this program. It was such a great uh, program. Uh, my business is fairly new. It's a digital marketing business, but uh, that said, there are um, uh, businesses that have also been um, uh, been in place for years and years. And I want to, I say all that to say that whether you're just starting out or you've been in business for decades, the BBS program has tons of resources. Um, again, you're connected with experts like Lori, who helped me get my numbers in order. Um, <laughs> and uh, with like a Deborah Darris, like she mentioned earlier, um, just all the experts that are a part of the program, um, they're, they, they just offer invaluable insight and just you know, lend their expertise, their experience, which is really great, especially as an entrepreneur and being able to hear stories from those who have actually walked the path that you're walking and can, you know, you, you're able to learn from their mistakes and learn from the things that they've experienced or have seen clients experience. And it just puts you in a much better, um, on a much better path for success. So let me quickly share my screen again because I would love for you guys to see the landing page for the BBS program, sorry. If you're like me, you got a lot going on and so your desktop is a little crazy. Um, <laughs> so here's the, landing, <laughs> here's the landing page for the BBS program. As you can see, it's uh, BBS or Black Business Strategies. And it's a business education con consulting and technical assistance program geared to help uh, level the playing field for black owned businesses um, affected by access to capital and you all can read it for yourselves, but they are accepting applications now for the third cohort. And so you'll, uh, the cohort begins March 3rd and the applications are due February 25th. So that's going to be Friday. So you'll want to be sure if you are interested and um, I'll keep scrolling so that you can see what uh, the program is about as well as benefits and some criteria for uh, being accepted into the program because you'll wanna be sure that you get your applications in ASAP. And they have rolling cohorts. So if you, for whatever reason, miss this cohort that's coming up, there will be another. Let me keep scrolling. And you get two classes with me, two hour long classes on finance. So that should be exciting within itself, right, Lauren? What a treat. And you know what? Those were pretty when as a um, participant, when I first saw that it would be, um, you know, an hour long session on finance, it was kind of daunting for me because me and numbers just sometimes don't get along. But Lori, the information that you share and the way you break things down, it just, I mean, uh, invaluable information. I cannot say that enough. 
You know, Lauren, sometimes me and numbers don't get along either. So don't feel you're alone on that. In fact, I once told a um, private client famously when they were just trying to make things look better, I said, I can't torture the data anymore to make it say what you want it to say. I would say that is my most famous consulting line amongst others. Okay, Lauren, now I'm going to put you on the spot again, and I'm going to ask you to be a techno guru, okay? Guys, we're getting fancy here. Can you play a video to help introduce our next, our guest? Can you play a video? Let's see if we can pull this off. We're getting uber fancy here. Go ahead, Lauren, take it away. All right, let's do it. We're gonna share my screen one more time. I'm super excited about this guest too. I cannot wait for you all to meet her and just to hear her story. So let me get this video started now. Excellent. And I'll stop it at the 40 second mark, okay. Lori. Hi, my name is Indian Tyler and I'm the CEO and founder of Packed Body Care. Packed Body Care is a comprehensive line of body care essentials formulated with some of the best ingredients nature has to offer. We offer moisturizers, exfoliants, deodorants, underarm detoxes, and we are developing a line of herbal teas right now. Uh, we take a 360 degree approach to self-care, which means fostering and loving on the mind, body, and soul. Here at PACT, we say, we want you to fall in love with your body every time you use the product. And that goes, that starts in the formulation process. That starts. Was that enough? That Did was, that isn't that great? exciting? Okay, guys, with no further ado, I'm very excited to welcome Indy and Tyler to the show. Hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that was the greatest introduction we've done yet. Thank you, Lauren, for pulling that off. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, we are very excited. Now, we know that you probably went through quite a lot to get where you're at. So why don't you start from the beginning, Indy, and how did, people love to hear this, how did you come up with it? Did you wake up one morning and say, I think I want to be an entrepreneur? How did this all come about? Well, no, that was not my story. Um, <laughs> and it's funny being in, you know, um, a member of the the Black Business Strategies cohort, you know, you hear about how people started their companies and they're so passionate and they're so excited. And, you know, they're like, oh, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. That, that was not my story. Um, before this journey, I was actually a consultant for salon professional brands. So I was traveling domestically um, and internationally with other brands educating about products um, that were used in salons, training sales teams, um, and working on the other side of things. And I loved it. I loved what I did. Um, I unfortunately, well, I fortunately got pregnant, but unfortunately was unable to sustain the business at that time because the business required me to travel 90% of the time. So I was always gone. I was never home. So then when I got pregnant, I was like, oh no like what in the world am i going to do and how am i going to sustain my business and obviously it couldn't be sustained because i needed to travel um and at the time we had teams working for us and you know pockets of people located throughout the um you know through mostly nationally but i say all that to say i realized very quickly that the business was built on me and i without me and without me at least being there a good majority of the time to facilitate the operations of the company it wasn't going to work so here i am pregnant trying to figure life out um and it was just an interesting space to be in because i had never been in a, in a space like that um so i i gave birth to my beautiful son who is now um about to be seven years old next week um and you know i was just like a new mom um, I guess unemployed at the time, <laughs> at the time, so to speak. Um, and I started making body care products for him. Um, I started making body care products for my son before he was born. Cause you know, as a new mom, I was like, oh my God, I only want the best. Da -da 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 -da. So I started making body care products for him and, um, I gave birth to him. And then it was like, life was just compounding on me. 
Um, you know, with the business not operating, my marriage kind of took a tumble that led, led us down a dark, dismal road. And, um, you know, Lori, I'm like an open book. Um, you know, I went through, um, a very difficult marriage, um, and, uh, found myself in a situation where, um, I was in an, in a relationship that was abusive. And so I had a new baby, no job. <laughs> And I was in an abusive relationship and it was just bad. Like all the way around, it was it was really, really bad. Um, so my business actually started out as a need. Um, I, at the time, I was going through all this craziness in life and um, my girlfriends, three of them, we were all going through different things. It was like a transition, so to speak. And so we got together and you said, you know what? We're going to make a pact and we are going to pour the same love, attention, and care into ourselves that we pour into our families. So we made this pact and we said, we're gonna start off with our body care products. We're only gonna use natural body care products. So we use natural body care products. So one night we go out dancing and I say, hey, I gotta stop at, um, at Walgreens. I gotta get my deodorant because I'm going natural. So I'm going natural, I put this deodorant on, we go out dancing. And there was this guy who was trying to dance with me and I was like, oh my God, he smells like onions. This is terrible. No, get away. So then we started playing Jenga and you know, there's that one little piece that you pull out and then everything goes like to kaput and then everybody goes, oh, well, that's what happened for me. So we pull out the piece and everybody goes, oh, and I'm like, oh my god that man is so strong i he's like clear across the room and i still smell onions and then that's when it realized girl the onion smell is you you smell like onions <laughs> and so that is how packed body care was formed i said oh uh-uh there's got to be a better way. I am up for the challenge. I am going to help create a solution that will help people transition from conventional deodorant to natural deodorant without smelling like onions. That's the pact. And that's when pact transitioned from a pact amongst my girlfriends and I to a pact with my community to offer high quality products that would bless them and allow them to nourish themselves. Oh my God, Lauren, is that not the best one we've gotten yet? <laughs> I, am, I don't even know where to go from there. Thank you for sharing us with it. Oh, that was great. Okay, so you got this idea, a strong desire <laughs> to make something different. By the way, before I go there, I have to say, I started my first company at 25 and people asked me if it was inspiration and I always tell them, no, it was desperation. That's what you, start, you start for two reasons, inspiration, desperation, but I think a, a lot of small businesses start for more desperation. But how did you, what happened next? What I like to do, Indian, is I like to walk people through that little bit of the weeds because a lot of times they hear people talk about the beginning and the success, but they're going, wait a minute, I'm right here. How did you get the first sale? How did you get the product put together? How did you get to where you are today? So walk us through what happened that allowed you to start making the product? How do you make the product? Where did you first sell it? All those type of things. Start with that story. So after, shortly thereafter, when I made the pact and it transitioned, um, here again, I was still in the situation. I mean, I, I had new baby, terrible marriage, was broken, all of that whole, whole thing. And um, I just needed a, needed a way to make some money. So I actually was in therapy for um, my situation with my marriage. And uh, my therapist said, you know what, Indian, um, I think I got a program for you. Cause I was like, listen, um, you know, I know we're talking about like positive relationships and self-esteem and all of that, but um, I don't have any gas money to get home. Like you got $5, like, I mean, it was just bad. And I was like, you know, you can't talk to me about healing until we talk about like financial literacy and financial healing. And for someone like me, I had been in business for over a decade. I was like, I never in a million years would have thought I would have found myself in a situation like I found myself in. And I was like, this is, truly unbelievable. Um, so she said, I think I found a program for you. And um, it was a program uh, in partnership with an organization called Free From. 
And that organization, um, their mission is to dismantle the nexus um, and really provide financial freedom for survivors of intimate partner violence. And I hounded them. She told me about the person. She said they had this entrepreneurial program. I think you would be great for it. Um, that's, that's all she gave me and a phone number. And I called that number. I must have called that number every single day for I don't know how long until someone I was on I was on vacation in Florida with my mother who was like, Indian, you need to come to Florida. Just relax. I'll, you know, I, I didn't have any money at the time. And she was like, I will pay for it. Um, you know, just come. So I brought my son down to Florida and I'll never forget it. I was so excited when I got the phone call from a representative from Free From, and they asked me a couple of questions, took an intake, and then when I got to back to LA, we met up, and the, because they wanted to meet me in person, the first thing that they asked me was, "What can you produce?" Because me being me, I'm I'm buttoned up, collared up. I'm thinking we're going to go back to consulting. They're going to tell me a way that I can travel with my baby and blah 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 blah. No, they said, "What can you produce? What can you make?" And I said. Uh, I mean, I make body care products for my for my son. Like, you know, that's what I make. I was like, oh, and I'm making this cool thing about this deodorant. Like, I'm really excited about that. And they saw like this sparkle and they were like, that's how you're going to get free. That's it right there. And then it really became into a full fledged business. And I got connected. That free from for me was honestly like the missing component. They connected me with lawyers. They connected me with um, uh, they helped me with my packaging. Um, it was like a sounding board um, of, of not only mentors, but also other entrepreneurs who were found themselves in the same situation as I was, who, were, who had experienced intimate partner violence or were experiencing it and were trying to get over the hump. So I had a support system of people who were going through the same thing, but we also had the mentorship and the guidance. And that is what, I mean, and we started off slow. My first sale came from a, um, an outdoor event that they were hosting. Um, and it was just like a little table that was set up and I had my products there and um, the mayor was there. And it, it was just, it, it, was, it was very, very small. And then it just gradually grew and built built you know we built it out from there okay we can't go without missing this what did it feel like when you made that first sale can you go back and remember that feeling i remember because it was cash <laughs> i remember taking that cash and feeling such a sense of pride and this is coming from someone who had a business before you know and who was successful and doing very well um, you know, I remember when I made the first sale of a product that I created, not a sale from something that someone else created. Like this was something that I, I made with my own two hands. It was like nothing I had ever experienced before because it just spoke to the testament of, um, and I'm faith-based, so I could get, could get, you know, I mean, it just spoke to the testament of what God had cre had allowed me to do and empowered me to do because other there was no way I would have made it through all of the turmoil that I was going through. Um, I, I remember days where I was making products like literally with a baby strap to my back. I now have two children, a baby strap to my back and another one asking for snacks. Like entrepreneurship is not easy. It's very, very difficult. And, and like you said so eloquently earlier, you know, everybody always talks about, um, you know, the success and how much money they're making and, you know, flossing on Instagram, like, oh, entrepreneurship is the greatest thing, but they don't tell you about the journey. And for everyone, the journey is very, very different. But the common thread is that there will be some triumphs and there will be some challenges. And sometimes those challenges are very great. It's so true. I've been self-employed pretty much since I've been 25 or so, and, and it's been up and down, but you know, you reminded me of something, a vision came back from my own memory. I'm aging myself right now because I'm going to say something. I was typing an invoice to the client on a typewriter. For those listening, you'd have to look like, <laughs> at typewriter to know what I'm talking about here. I understand that, right? But here's what really resonated with me. I remember it was this weird experience that I'm sitting there typing this invoice, minding my own business, but my brain's going somewhere else. And suddenly I can see it like it was yesterday. I picked my hands off of the typewriter and I looked at them and I went, these hands, these hands had made my own income for a year. 
And I had a situation with a, an employer that was, you know, doing things that weren't good and all this. So it was kind of desperation to start my own thing. But I looked at my hands once more and I made a promise to myself, these hands will always be in control of my financials from this point on and never okay. looked back. So I, I can totally relate to what you're saying. So tell us how, where did you go next? So you had your first sale. I think that's a wonderful story. I loved hearing it. How did you then start to move? Because what I find Indian is that lots of people succeed first. Um, I call doing the sales within the inner circle, you know, the first cherry picking, you know, that old term, they kind of fall into play. But when you start to expand beyond that circle where you have to get involved with marketing and some kind of getting exposure, I use the word exposure to new people, that's where it becomes challenging. And it becomes challenging from the marketing and then also the making the product and the distribution. So I'm going to bundle all those together and let you tell the story from from that point on? Well, wholesale has always been our model, even up until this day. Um, and, you know, I had to always remind myself not to look to the left or to the right and look at what everybody else was doing and just stay on, on our path. Oh, Lauren, um, please write that in the chat. That is awful. Awesome. I'm awful. That is awesome. So many people change their direction every time they go. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt Indian, but no, you made okay. such a valid point. When somebody makes something so important, I, I stop them and I have Lauren write it. I have entrepreneurs all the time. The minute they hear somebody did this, I'm going to do this. Somebody did this, I'm going to do this. And they run around all over and they exhaust themselves and they get nowhere. So thank you for saying that, Indian. Keep going if I didn't mess you up. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, so I mean, it just... I had to always stay committed and true to where our business was and where we were going. Um, and, you know, social media is great, but social media can also mess you up because that's where you see what everyone else is doing. And, you know, it looks like it's so great, but our model works and still to this day work, work then. And it was still to this day works for us um, because our products are so intentional there some of our products take days to make like literally days to make so we have to have a distribution model that supports our particular process we have a commitment to quality products we have a co commitment to quality ingredients and we have a commitment to um to to our standards and we can't sacrifice on that so where we went from where we started was we, we started with very, very small, making products in very, very small batches. I think I had like one mixer. No, I didn't even have a mixer. I had a hand blender. <laughs> then I thought I was real hot stuff when I got like a, 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 a actual electric mixer. I was doing a darn thing. Um, and I made a goal. I said, I want to get to the point where we can focus on the business and we don't have, to, I don't, I don't have to make products anymore. We got to that point. Eventually I went with one mixer. We transitioned into more volume and doing more mixing, still making them in-house. And I had this brilliant idea. I said, well, let's go to, um, to a manufacturer to get our products made. Wrong move, wrong move. Here again. You. Yeah, it, it just, it didn't, it didn't work for us because we had no control over our standards. And I always like to say, like, when you're in business, like, you have to be very, very mindful of where you are and your buying power. We didn't have any, I didn't have any buying power. You know, I mean, we, I was having meetings. Lauren, has Indian's voice gone out or is it just on my end? Okay, there we go. There you go. There you go. Okay. Um, so I was taking all this time and I was meeting with these manufacturers and I was forsaking our wholesale business trying to get to these manufacturers. So I was kind of like, you know, a little distracted there. And we finally got a manufacturer that took us because, you know, that was the gift. They were doing yeah. us a favor by taking on our brand because they never do that because they never work with anyone so small. And so they're doing us this big favor and the whole thing flopped. If, if, if it, it absolutely flopped. I think we went through two rounds with the manufacturer. The products weren't good. The standards weren't good. 
Um, we wound up obviously losing a lot of money because we had to throw everything away. It was just, it was just, it was just awful. You know, um, Indian, I'm glad you're sharing that because this is not an unusual story. I hear everybody says, oh, if I can just get a manufacturer and they also say it about a big distributor. And I know a, a couple of clients actually experienced this through the SBDC where the worst day is they got a distributor and they got a manufacturer. It burned up all their profit. They had no control over it and it harmed them and they ended up increasing the sales, but decreasing their profit and at the end of the day profit matters well a profit totally matters and the, and and time too you know the time that it takes to get the manufacturer the time that it takes to secure the manufacturer with your personal you know with your company protocols and what exactly you want and it's almost like a a, a you know like a, a a balance beam relationship because it's like well you can't when you're small you can't push the manufacturer too hard because you don't want to upset them or irritate them because remember they're doing you a favor by taking on your brand so it's like you know you're always in this constant struggle you know you're the you know not at the bottom of the totem pole but you know you you know you're not the one getting the all of the attention you know what i mean it's 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 you so it's 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 a vulnerable place to be in and when you pick a manufacturer and manufacturing can be great when it's the right relationship it's like dating you know, you date, you go out, you're like, yeah, no, yeah, no. You try somebody else, you're like, yeah, no. Or this one might work. And then it finds out there, then it's not gonna work. But all of that takes a lot of time. And all of that takes a lot of energy and resources. And kind of with manufacturing, you really don't know until you get in the thick of things, just like in dating. Like you don't know who you're dealing with until you really deal with them. And really until there's conflict, because you know, how you handle conflict can make or break the relationship. So long story short, like we got the manufacturer, they're, they were making our products. By this time, our, our um, purchase orders had increased. Um, and, you know, we were, our, our claim to fame was really uh, subscription boxes. Like being amongst good company in a subscription box that really okay. worked for us from a, distribu from a distribution um, standpoint. Um, so yeah, so we get this manufacturer, it goes to crap. Um, and then I realized that wasn't the way to go. So we had to pull back and bring all of the products back in house. And this was right around the time that the pandemic was happening. So a couple, it is crazy story. A couple months prior, I myself was involved in a slip and fall accident and broke both of my wrists at the same time. Yes. Well, you got to make products. Right. Well, well, yeah. So we yeah. were kind of in the manufacturing situation. So, I mean, it was, I knew in my mind, it, the manufacturer situation wasn't going to work. And I remember laying on the hospital bed when they finally told me, oh, well, both of your wrists are broken. I was like, oh my God, I'm doomed. I'm doomed. There's no, I was like, okay, because you know, as an entrepreneur, you pivot in your mind very quickly. You always have a plan. So I had already pivoted in my mind. I'm like, okay, so the manufacturer isn't gonna work. Uh, we'll just go to making products, you know, for, you know, uh, two quarters and then we'll, you know, pick up and, and go off to the races and, and we'll keep going. I broke my wrist. So that, pro that plan went straight to, you know what? Because it was like, how are you gonna make products with two broken wrists, girl? So I was laying in the hospital bed, eventually got transferred to a nursing home. It was awful. And um, I was down for months, 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 just down because I, I couldn't do anything. I had to heal. I had only been driving for two days. And, and that's when the city of LA shut down. I was like, huh. I just can't win, can I? Because we finally made it over the hump with me breaking my wrist. I just started back driving. I was like, well, we can do, I was doing anything. If there was an outdoor market, we were going to do it. We were going to hit the, hit the ground running with stores, blah, 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 blah. And the world shut down. How did you keep going? What did you do next? Free from here again. Oh wow! The connection, the the connections, and I'll never forget one of my mentors. She um she told me something this year. She said you have everything you need, and I was like, huh? I was I didn't. I just went with it. I was like, okay, I have everything I need. And as I went over our company journals, and as I went over the timeline of the evolution of our brand, 
I realized throughout every single point, we did have everything we needed. No matter what challenge came our way, we had everything we needed. And, it, it, and now I kind of live by that. You have everything you need. It's just a matter of activating what you have to fulfill your need. So free from a few months back prior to me breaking my wrist, they said, hey, Indian, we're having a conference. Can you, can you make some, um, like some hand cleansers? And I was like, that's not sexy, but yeah, I can totally do that. I was like, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So um, I had this formula um, and I also had a connection um, with a manufacturer that could take the formula and make it in bulk. And so we started making hand sanitizers of all things. I never in a million years thought we would be making hand sizers. And that hand was the product in demand. And that was product. what did it. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was what did it. We were, we, 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 we sourced, um, homeless shelters and, um, some of those, uh, pop-up COVID relief programs. I mean, and this was at a time where you couldn't even get alcohol. Um, and then, so that, that sourcing became an issue, but we were able to overcome that, but it was always, there was always like a ram in the thicket, an ace in the hole, whatever you want to call it. There was always like light at the end of the tunnel. And hand sanitizers during the pandemic were, were just that. Wow. You know, you're, you're so right about the fact that you have everything you need right now. I remember some time ago, I was, this is like decades ago, but I kept thinking if I just read the next entrepreneur book, if I just find out the next bit of information, if I just, and I realized that whenever I cr needed a solution, I was trying to grab and I needed to stop doing that. So I said, no, you have enough information, act on it. And I told myself no more information. And that was so true. And the other thing I was reminded of when you were speaking, Back once again in my early, you know, twenties, early thirties, I was worried I wasn't going to have enough sales come in the next month. And, and an older entrepreneur told me this. He says, "You know, what's going to happen is you're going to say I can't go beyond this point without getting a sale. And then what's going to happen is you're going to get to that point and you're going to find out, well, maybe I can go beyond that point a little bit. And then it's going to turn around. And so now I'm always like, okay, I just got to go a little bit behind my beyond my mental point and look for what's available." Available to me and something will come. I think that being an entrepreneur, you know, people talk about it being passionate and everything. And that to me is just the Hollywood definition. I think, and tell me your thoughts on this, Indy, and maybe I'm speaking from my own biography. I think it was a lot of just having a spirit and the survivalist meant mindset. You know, I didn't they have anybody I can turn to and say, hey, bail me out, you know, and I know you did mm -hmm. from your story. So it was not like if I can, should I can, whether I can, it was just, you have to. So you do mm -hmm. it and you look down and you just keep going. And that sounds what you've experienced a lot along the way as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for me, having kids, you know, you, you, you think motherhood and you think this euphoric journey and it, it was euphoric and it was beautiful and it continues to be beautiful. But it also came with a very unique set of challenges for me, because with that, I mean, my time was gone. I wasn't able to travel as much. It created a, a lot of things. Um, it really banged on the vulnerability in my business. Um, it really exposed all of the vulnerability motherhood did for me. Um, and then it turned into, let's build this out so that nothing can by any means harm it, or we can pivot and transition so quickly that we're all, by the time the challenge tries to catch up with us or defeat us, we're already on to the next solution. And so it created like a warrior type yeah. spirit in me, which was always there, but it really like magnified that warrior nature in me. And now, um, cause you know, my business was completely bootstrapped in the beginning and now we're a team of 10. Um, and it's very small. We're still very small micro business, very humble, but I have a lot of pride in that because we hire people like that. Like that's part of our interview process because I understand that challenges will come. And in order to be a contributing member of the team, like I can show you how to make products. 
we, you know, we can, we can teach you all the ins and outs of the business, but what I can't teach you, and you kind of have to come a, with, with at least a seed of that, is that warrior spirit. To, to not let anything stop you. So the people on our team are veterans. They're um, other survivors of intimate partner violence, single moms. Like all of us have this, this very, uh, we're very, very like-minded people. Um, and it makes for a wonderful team. It makes, you know, a wonderful powerhouse, small but mighty team of people who don't let anything get in their way. And we're very proud of that. And that's what we put into our products. That's what the customers get. You know, when we had to move from the manufacturer to um, to in-house, like I literally had just moved my kids to, to Maryland as a result of the pandemic. So I had my kids in Maryland, my business was, in, um, was, was still in LA, and here we have no manufacturer. So what are we gonna, you know, like what, 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 are, we, what are we doing? Um, and I remember that day when we finally, when I finally pulled the trigger and I was like, okay, we got to get everything from the manufacturer and we just need to do a hard company reset. And it, 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 it happened like this. Like I was like, we, we need to do it now because if we wait another day or another month, we're going to have orders that we won't be able to fulfill and we're going to risk losing clients. So we can't keep, we, we can't put ourselves in that position. So I literally called it. I was like, we need a hard company reset, get everything from the, I, I don't care if it's paper napkins. If they're there and they're ours, go get them. And I was 3000 miles away. And I remember not sleeping for like three days, preparing for this hard company reset and getting back all of our goods. I was like, you know, and then it, it makes me think, well, are, are we gonna get our goods? You know, are they gonna are they gonna be compromised in any way? Like, how are we gonna work that out? How are we gonna transport all this stuff? Where are we gonna put it? Well, where you put it? Where you used to make the products? Used to make the products in house. We have moved, so now the space that you know my children and I used to live in is now transformed into <laughs> a laboratory. <laughs> That's great. Like we got stainless steel tape, like a whole yep. full fledged laboratory. Because in order to support the space that we needed, we would have needed a commercial space. And I knew what what was going to come my way: restaurants and things. Because we need a full kitchen. Right. And I knew that we don't need you know a five thousand square foot facility. You know, with a full commercial kitchen, we don't need that. So, and why pay for something like that? And it's just wasted space. So we transformed what we did have here again, going back to you have everything you need. We transformed what we did have to suit our needs. Gotcha, gotcha. And for those guys that are listening, if you hear some weird things in my background, it's hailing right now. So I apologize about the hailing <laughs> on this part, but it's hailing. So Indian, tell us a little bit about um, the customer acquisition. I know you said that you can go through wholesale. I've got one of the uh, in the audience want to know, you know, what do you mean by that? How are you selling the product? How did you go about getting the customers, which are through the wholesale? Give us some deep dives on getting those connections to start selling selling your product and how that evolved and where you see it going. Free From was very instrumental in building those relationships. Very, very instrumental. And it, and I only wanted to do it when the time was right. So they were kind of like, um, I know in, salon, in the salon professional space, we have this thing called brokers. And so brokers will actually shop your product to all of the big box um, distribution outlets and, and all of that and all of that. So Free From was kind of like our broker. Um, they helped um, identify customers, identify distribution outlets, and they really, really, really were instrumental in assisting us with our customer acquisition. Some customers we found in our, found on our own. Some customers um, we realized after talking with them they weren't a very good fit because of the nature of our products. Um, so we, we are really honestly still going through that process slowly but surely of acquiring more customers and landing more accounts. But here again, you got for where we are as a company, it's back to that don't look to the left, don't look to the right. Optimize what's working and grow that and build upon that. And so that's where we are right now. Over the holiday time, I said, well, let's just test it out. Let's see if we can do um, D to C business. No, that's not our model. 
Okay. Like for us, it take to make one product or 5,000, it's really the same amount of time because of our process. You know, getting back to the point, some of our products take days to make. So putting, you know, like one souffle or one armpit detox into a package and shipping it off to a customer, that is not profitable for us. Now, it might be profitable for another business and that might fit well in that business, but that doesn't fit. Our, our, our process does not support that. You know, and I've heard from different people that have all natural type products or anything that takes longer to produce. Of course, there's a cost involved in that and it's a higher price point. And so they have to find a market that understands and respects that higher price point, if I can say it that way. In fact, someone from the audience was asking about that. Why do natural products cost more? Which I think, you know, a lot of what you said already explains it. But to those in the audience that have a product that they have to price outside of the cheaper portions of the competitors around them how do what experiences have you had where you have to communicate to the audience through your customers your wholesalers the value of the product and therefore the price point have you had some had some experiences in that area that you can share sure first i i think the f first part of that started with me um and understanding the value and the quality of my product um, that was the very first thing. I had to get comfortable with the price I had to charge to be in business. I had to get comfortable with that because, I mean, with natural body care goods, I mean, you know, we sometimes we were at markets and we, you know, we were selling, you know, body care products for 40 and $50 and two booths down, you can get a similar product for $12. And I had to think, I'm like, okay, well, first of all, we don't even know if that business is profitable. That's right. number one. Oh, you don't even know that, Lauren. Right. Boy, I tell you, Indian is saying so many things dear to my heart. You can sell it cheap, but you're not profitable and you can't buy a quart of milk at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, and then furthermore, how are we going to make payroll off of that? Like we, we can't, <laughs> you know, we, we cannot do that. And all of our products are formulated with top quality essential oils. We can trace back our essential oil batches to the farm from which it was harvested. And that is, you know, we take a lot of pride in that because that allows us to have a lot of control over our products and a commitment and a standard in our ingredients that sets us apart from most companies. So I had to get comfortable with charging what we were worth. Going back to dating, when you start dating, you know, when you're like looking for someone to partner with, you have to go into it realizing your own worth and being comfortable with that and being comfortable with demanding your worth and not settling for anything less than that because someone will appreciate you. Your customers, your particular customers will appreciate you. So as long as you understand your worth and you stay committed and true to your worth and you communicate what creates that worth. Is it your process? Is it your ingredients? Is it your expertise if you're a service provider? I mean, because, you know, service providers, oh my gosh, you know, the, it's it's the complete spectrum as far as cost is concerned. Like somebody, one person could charge, you know, $100 an hour and another person could charge, you know, 5000 an hour. It just depends on your level of expertise and what you're, what you're offering. But your customer will appreciate what you have to offer. And you know, it's just a matter of finding that customer and staying connected and true to that customer and not trying to get every other customer. Like my customer that would spend 12, you know, a customer that would spend $12 on a body care, that's not my customer. I don't want that customer. So much wisdom, India. And you know, like I said, I, t I talked about it before. You have to first make the sale to yourself. And I think yes. I kind of see it a lot with women more. I don't mean to stereotype on women, so I guess I can, but they kind of feel like they have to apologize for a price and they're not, not as stern. Now, not all, but I really have to get people to say that your price is not dependent so much on what your competitor is selling. It depends on your cost structure. How much does it cost you to produce? What is your overhead? Like you said, can you make payroll on it? So you really have to identify what you have to sell it at, first of all, then identify, like you said, the value, identify your customer, communicate that value. Um, just excellent words of wisdom that you spoke all along. And the other part of not 
trying to sell to everybody. I, I, I recognized a long time ago, you know, especially when I did a lot of high level consulting, everybody wasn't my customer, you know, especially I love small businesses, but the point was when I was being the CFO for companies, small businesses couldn't afford me. That was exactly. my whole starting of business simply put and writing books and doing lectures and ending up at the SBDC to be able to work with the small company. But I recognized it and I realized the only way I could sell to the small companies is to do it in seminars where I'm getting multiple people paying for the amount versus one. And that was a understanding where it's financially driven. And it sounds through our whole interview, what I'm really impressed with you, Indian, not only, you know, aside from the wisdom, the motivation, and just love your spirit, but you have a very sound financial business mindset, which I'm sure you obtained over the time period, but you always come back to what is it going to cost us? What do we have to sell it? You just really on good sound principles. And I can't thank you enough for sharing that with the audience. They really need to hear it. So in our moments left, you know, if you were to say, pick a number three to five, I don't care in the end. But if you say, hey, if I could tell you guys the top things to help you succeed or to watch out for, what would they be? Have thick skin. Have thick skin is number one. Um, cause sometimes, you know, this Lori, you know, the numbers don't like you, your team won't like you. You have to make decisions that are going to upset everything, the numbers, the team, your family, everything. And you have to have thick skin and be committed with whatever decisions you make and have the wherewithal that if you make the wrong decision, you know how to fix it and trust in that. So that would be number one. Um, Number two would be to let your profit lead you. And I know that sounds kind of bad. No, I love it. I love it. Lauren, you got to no, put that in the chat. Gotta that, put that in the sounds chat. bad because everybody <laughs> wants to be so noble in business. You know, they want to be so giving and benevolent and all of this. And your benevolence comes with the team that you hire. Your benevolence comes with the quality product that you offer. Your benevolence does not come with your bottom line. Because if you don't have a black bottom line, you don't have a business. <laughs> so you have to let your product lead you, your profit lead you, or you will be out of business. There will be no benevolence. There will be no community building. There will be no passion behind your product. There will be none of that. It, it will be just a hobby. I wish we could get this to play through all entrepreneurship programs throughout the world because what you just said is so correct just so correct and by the way guys if you have any questions start throwing them in the q a i'm going to have an open q a for indian in a minute please continue indian and so my third one would be stop and smell the roses celebrate your wins yeah celebrate your wins because that will be one of the driving forces that gives you the motivation to keep on going to and and create a journal take videos take pictures you know even if it's just you and your team members or just you if it's just you um you know take videos so that you can remind yourself of the evolution of your company and the evolution of whatever it is that you're building because you will need that documentation to get you through the rough times because every time there was like what what could have been a, a um a crisis because when, the, when we had to pull from the manufacturer, at first we started calling it um, a crisis. We were like, okay, we're in, we're in crisis. And then I said, no, 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 no. We gotta take crisis out of it. It's, we're not in a crisis, okay? This here is, um, it's a challenge. So then we changed it to challenge. And I was like, I still don't like that. I'm just not putting me in a good space. I don't like challenge, <laughs> okay, challenge, yeah, da, 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 da. And I said, you know what? You know what this really is? This is an opportunity for us to fix some of the cracks in our foundation. And this is an opportunity for us to change our process and protocols to meet this situation and for us to grow. We are in an opportunity zone. It's not a crisis. It's not a challenge. It is an opportunity for us, you know, come, business is calling us all to the carpet, particularly me. It's calling me to the carpet and I've got to perform, I've got to execute. And we've got to win. We don't have any other choice. That's the only option we have, we have to win. So this is an opportunity for us to win 
against some very interesting odds. Yeah, you know what I have noticed? I mean, I cannot tell you the thousands of companies that I have consulted with. You know, I've been around for quite some time. And from small companies to $60 million companies to turnaround companies. And one thing that, you know, I can say for sure from my own personal experience, pretty much almost every one of those companies could survive. They just have to change something within their business model, within their cost structure. Usually it's about changing a selling price, maybe the cost, maybe a distribution, some management, some employees. But I've not really run into any clients, but just a few whose product maybe were so outdated or could not even be produced for the amount it needed or just didn't have enough demand where they just didn't have a business. What they didn't have was a working plan. But if they took the model and just started turning it a little bit and making those decisions that they had to make, they could take off again. It's just they were painful decisions, especially if they meant eliminating somebody that's been with them for a long time or mm -hmm. changing the price point in the marketplace. Another thing that I find interesting thing is I've, I always am looking at people's financials and going over the cost structure, as you know, from the kitty sweater. Remember the kitty sweater? Kitty sweater, sweater. yeah. Everybody, I'm famous for the kitty sweater. I'll share that with you guys sometime. My I kids. love that kitty, kitty sweater. <laughs> so, so funny. I have become so famous for the teaching of the kitty sweater where I teach cost structure in a matter of no time at all. But yeah, I'm famous for the kitty sweater. But I, in fact, in, in a minute, my kitty might actually walk onto the stage here because I just saw <laughs> coming near me. But um, what, I, what I find with the kitty sweater is I would tell people you have have to increase your selling point. You can't continue, or like you said, you won't have any profit. You won't be in business. And I constantly hear, if we increase the price, we're going to go, nobody will buy, nobody will buy, we can't. And I say, well, why don't we just do it by a dollar? Why don't we do it by 50 cents? Why don't we do it by this? And then before you know, they're increasing it to where they're profitable. And I say, at the end, because I know I can't ask them then, they're too freaked out. By the way, how many customers did you lose? Well, we didn't lose any, just a few, yep. but they were kind of bad customers anyway. You know, right. that is mm -hmm. always what I get. And I actually have had a few clients that have turned their business around, became completely profitable. And I asked them later, I said, well, how were you able to stand by your pricing? And they go, well, your Excel document that you made me right here was the boss. Every time I go, I'm going to sell it for no, I look back at the kitty sweater Excel document and go, oh, nope, I'm going to be as Lori's famous line, do you want to be more tired and more broke? And that's what people think. They can just sell themselves out of a financial situation. And often you can't because, you know, your, your sales goes up, your cost goes up. Maybe you have a little economies of scale. So you find out you're just more tired and more broke. And, and more broke. <laughs> and who wants to be more tired? You know, and my other thing is, you know, I have people say, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And then I, you know, listen to all. And I just say, and can you buy a quart of milk? <laughs> Because everybody's got to buy a quart of milk or something to that equivalent. So I can't thank you enough, Indian, for sharing your story, for sharing everything. This has been wonderful. Um, it's just been inspirational. And what I love it is anytime people come on and they start talking about the need for the financial bottom line, it just brings me so ha such happiness. So um, if somebody wants to purchase your product, they can purchase it on your website or where can they go to purchase your products? Yes, packedbodycare.com. That, that we are on um, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Packed Body Care. And um, you can find us online at packedbodycare.com. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Thank you for having me. Hey, Lauren, I want to do a shout out to you before you do the final closing. So we, we're going to make a little bit of a mention of something we're going to talk about in um, the next couple of weeks to come. Lauren um, will tell you more about it, but it's just kind of a little introduction. There is going to be a grant program that is coming up and it's starting now. Applications will come out soon. It's only for those starting new businesses, from what I understand, Lauren. And it's going to be a $5,000 or $10,000 grant. And SBDC is going to be partnering in the processes where, and Lauren will fill you in a little bit more, but you're going to be going through some trainings, et cetera, as part of the process. There'll be an application to go through. I'm, I think I'm going to be one of the instructors for one of the training. Lauren already tapped me into it. So it's called California your dream fund we're going to have more information in the upcoming weeks is there anything that i you want to add to that lauren because you're on top of this program more than i am right now 
Yes, thank you, Lori. Actually, I think it was Susan who mentioned that she was just starting a business. Um, I, I just told her to shoot me an email. So I included uh, into the chat a landing page that we just created dedicated to this new program. It's uh, smallbizla.org forward slash dream fund. A few of you may have already heard about it. I believe GoBiz has already sent out a press release. Um, we are one of the, and let me get the, the, the proper name for it. We're a designated training partner for the California Dream Town fund. And so there are several training partners uh, throughout the state of California. The Los Angeles Network, SBDC, is a training partner. And for the program, like Lori mentioned, you're to be a new business. Um, you'll go through our program. And upon completion, your information will be submitted to Lindustry, who's the company that will be distributing the funds. And then, um, yeah, it's both $5,000 and $10,000 grants. Yeah, and we're getting more information as the program is coming on live. And so we'll be talking about it next week. And then as soon as we get started, we'll be announcing it like we always do. Um, I always want to say anybody that wants to meet with me personally or has a question, get through Lauren. I think I... Um, I think I have addressed everybody's question that's been sent to me so far, but if I hadn't anything falls through the cracks, you just hit me up again. And uh, once again, I wanna thank everybody. This was another great interview. It was just another fascinating story. We're having so much fun here. I hope you guys are having fun. Thank you for joining. And Lauren, I'm gonna send it back to you to end the show. Thank you so much, Lori. And to you and Indian, oh my goodness. First off, Indian, I don't think I've laughed so hard, but it was just so good. Your little nuggets of information, I mean, beyond, beyond grateful. So good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. for It's been a wonderful time, Lori. It's always great talking to the both of you. Um, Lori, you make numbers laugh and cry and scream and holler. <laughs> And um, that definitely shows in the show. So I'm really excited for the show for you too and, and what great things this is going to be and how it's going to really help and bless the community. Thank you, Indian. Thank you, Indian. That was amazing. Thank you. Oh, Emma said it in the chat. She said, you need to write a book, Indian. And she is so right. Either a book or an audio book or a podcast. Girl, I would be tuning in. So. <laughs> you know what? We're going to have to have some time where we have like Emma and Indian come back and a few of our other guests and we have a whole party on the show and we create the chat just as part of the show. I think we need to do that sometime. Oh, that would be so good. <laughs> so knows? good. I mean, we're getting so creative here, guys. There's no, I mean, we got videos presenting people now, you know, we're going to, in fact, next time, I think we got to get that audio clap going, Lauren. I think we need the audio clap. So um, we're, we're waiting for Oprah to call us. We're sure go. Oprah's going to be calling us soon. We're just convinced of it. <laughs> Well, um, at that point, I'll be gifting you guys with packed body care products so that you can put them on the show and all of that. Yeah, so. So you guys keep me in mind for that Oprah thing, okay? <laughs> okay, Lauren, let's uh, close this out and we'll see everybody next week. Okay, we'll do. Again, Indian, thank you so much. Have an amazing day. Thank you for joining us and just for all the information and stories and insight that you've lent to us all. Um, just like Lori meant, or Indian mentioned earlier, I've included her website into the chat, but it's packbodycare.com. Um, and I'll include the link once again so you guys can see that again. Uh, if you would like to see a recording of our show, I'll include our link to our YouTube. And then, um, yeah, I'll also include a link for a submission page. I forgot to mention it earlier, Lori. So if anyone has a suggestion for a show topic, if they have additional questions for Lori or even for Indian, um, or if they want to be a guest, they're an entrepreneur and they have some nuggets of information that they'd like to share, I'll include that uh, link into our chat and then uh, just fill out the form and we'll get back to you. So again, thank you for joining us for Small Biz Talk as solutions for your small business. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again on next Wednesday and the following Wednesday and following Wednesday at 10 a.m. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. 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 I'm gonna hang back everyone and re-paste in those 
links so that you can see them. It's a whole welcome message, but I'm gonna pop that in there again. And checking the chat really quickly. Um, so I'm going to include that link for all our new businesses. Oh, sorry about that. I thought that was the link, the proper link, but it's for the California Dream Fund. Again, we'll have additional information coming online soon. And then for those of you who need to get in contact with either myself or Lori, I'm going to put in my email address right now. Okay, there's that. And then let's see if I'm missing anything. I don't believe so. I'll hold on a couple of minutes just so that you guys can copy those links again. Oh, Khadija, I see a franchising business or building a franchise business. Oh, that's a good one. I'll include that into our list. And we have experts on our team that um, have run uh, franchises or bought into them. So if you're looking for information on that, please, please, please get in contact with us. Susan, yes. Yes, that is okay. And I see that you've already, for those of you who are clicking onto that Dream Fund link and signing up, as soon as we have additional information out, we will be sure to uh, contact you and make sure that you um, receive a link to our application. It is a first come first serve. So we wanna be sure that you all sign up. Okay, let's see. And then it is, let's put in, I think I see a request for an Indian's website. And there it is. Maria, there's the link for Indian. And I think I've covered it all, I believe. My email address is lsimpson at lbcc.edu. You're welcome, Susan. Okie dokie, everyone. Have a wonderful day, a great remainder of the week. We're almost to the weekend. Woohoo. And we'll see you again next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Thank you. Bye.